uh, we'll get going. And I see that our friends on YouTube have just joined us. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Robert Colville, Director of the Centre for Policy Studies, and I'm here with Douglas Ross, the leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, um, at a time when the, the, the challenges facing the Scottish Conservatives and the Unionists are um, more in, uh, acute and more important than they've been for, for quite some time. Um, how this will work is a fairly standard format. Uh, Douglas and I will talk for about um, half an hour, um, then we'll um, try and take some questions from the audience. If you're watching on YouTube, um, you can ask them in the YouTube um, comment box and um, our team will, will spot them and feed them in. Otherwise, um, please uh, put them in the Q&A and, um, and we'll, um, we'll try and um, uh, put them forward. Um, we've already had some um, in advance, which I've got in front of me. Um, so Douglas, let's start with an easy one. Um, the only, arguably the only job that makes you more uh, more hated than being a football match official is being leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Are you, I mean, are you, are, you, are you sort of still happy you took the took the job on? I mean, you know, any any regrets about, about it so far? Uh, no, none at all. But, but first of all, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for inviting me to, to join you today and to, to have this discussion. In terms of the analogy between a football official and uh, being a, a politician, even just a general politician, they're, they're not the most popular uh, of um, uh, things for, for people to do. But I actually find them quite similar. Being a, a political leader in Scotland and being a match official, you've got to uh, take quick decisions sometimes. You've got to, to believe in your, your convictions, have the courage of your convictions, take an awful lot of flack. Um, I've done a couple of Facebook Lives and, and some of the flack I've taken on that it has been less than the flack I've got in the 7-0 firm matches that I've done. Um, and uh, yeah, you've got to, to bring people with you. So uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, the job as leader of the Scottish Conservatives. I don't underestimate the challenges uh, we face uh, right now uh, in the country, both with the elections coming up, but also with the COVID pandemic that we're also dealing with uh, at a UK level and here in Scotland. But no, um, I'm relishing the opportunities to get out on whatever the, the campaign trail will look like in a few months time we don't know how the election will be conducted uh, but i think we've got a lot to offer we've done a lot of work developing our policies uh, as scottish conservatives since i became leader uh, and there's a lot uh, that we're going to build on in the weeks and months ahead so obviously as a match official you can't have any any favorite teams but is 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 the parallel of, uh, of rangers quite encouraging that um, a, a seemingly impregnable period of domination from uh, from the other side of the uh, fence and, and it, it, it crumbles uh, in the face of the sort of determined uh, new uh, new signings. If, if I answer any question about Rangers or Celtic, then I am doomed for failure. So all I'm concentrating on is, uh, you know, in terms of, of the challenge we face, something to put into context that, that many uh, commentators, certainly south of the border, sometimes forget is the SNP have only ever once had a majority uh, in Scotland and they lost that at the last election because of the Scottish Conservatives. We more than doubled the number of our MSPs to prevent the SNP continuing with the majority in Scotland. So it's all to play for. Uh, we are the only credible alternative uh, to the SNP and that's the fight I'm taking to people across Scotland. And uh, obviously I mean, you, you said repeatedly that you're not going to sort of make predictions about seat numbers or how, how you think it's going but I mean how how is the campaign I mean are, are you happy with how the campaign is going and what are the challenges of doing this as you say at a time when you don't know whether you'll be able to knock on doors you don't know uh, you know pretty much you know it, you don't know whether the elections might even be, be postponed. Well, well, that is the challenge in terms of just how do you campaign? So it may be that by early May, it is possible to hold an election, but how possible has it been to actually rigorously campaign, both challenging the, the current Scottish government and looking at all the different parties and their platforms and just getting out and engaging with voters. So we are looking at all opportunities to do that. You know, I, I made the example of of Facebook Live because that's one way to engage with people. We're putting a, a lot of resources into our social media campaign because it is going to be different from knocking on people's doors and speaking face to face. Uh, but also, as I say, you know, we are building up a considerable policy platform. When I became leader uh, back in the summer, I made a commitment in my first month as leader, I would publish a paper uh, on jobs in the economy. So we did that. Our Powered Up Scotland document got a lot of um, you know, approval from uh, across Scotland. You know, we want to invest in all parts of the country. We want to protect people's jobs. We want to support businesses. Followed that up with a policy paper on education because we were told by Nicola Surgeon when she became First Minister, it would be her number one priority and judge her on that. Well, anyone judging the SNP 
on education, we'd have to judge it as a failure. We've seen a huge reduction in the number of teachers. It, we've seen a lack of investment in our schools, and we've got a lot of policies to improve the chances of young people. We've been doing work uh, on uh, drug deaths in Scotland. Scotland is the highest drug deaths anywhere in Europe, and that's partly as a result of the Scottish Government reducing funding to rehab. Now, I'm delighted after a Scottish uh, Conservative pressure, the Scottish Government have put £20 million into to drug rehab this year, but there's a lot we're doing on a vast array of policies uh, to really bring a platform to people across Scotland. So obviously, that the election is being reported in the in in London as as being primarily a referendum on the union, partly because of the consequences if if there's a large SNP majority and they're emboldened to go for another independence referendum or, or at least to, to ask for one. I mean, I, what, what's your sense of you know how, how obviously the union is a huge huge issue. Is, is this when you talk to voters, is is this the issue that's uppermost in their mind, or is is the pandemic um, uh, the, the most important, or or is it these the other the whole range of other policy issues that, as you said, just tend to get crowded out of the of the debate because of the the huge uh, uh, you know the, the huge importance of the of the union. Well, right now, it really is about the pandemic. People are, are worried about catching this virus. They're worried about uh, friends or family who become infected or, or end up in hospital or sadly lose their life uh, lives as a result of COVID-19. Uh, and people are worried about their jobs. They know that the UK government's furlough scheme has protected almost a million jobs in Scotland, but they're worried about what happens after the, the health emergency and when we deal with the economic response to COVID-19. So I would say really that the focus on Scotland amongst people I, I speak to and, and voters is very much on COVID-19. <clears throat> and excuse me, right now on the vaccine rollout, because we are seeing problems in Scotland, not just highlighted by myself as leader of the main opposition party, but by GPs, by the, the BMA in Scotland, real concerns and worries about the, the rollout of the COVID vaccine in Scotland and the fact that we are lagging behind. We know there's over 700,000 doses available in Scotland, but those aren't getting into people's arms quickly enough. So that's really where the, the focus of people is right now to ensure that we ramp up the, the vaccine efforts here uh, in Scotland and we get through COVID and then they might start to focus more on some of the other issues. I mean, in fact, that, that was going to be one of the questions that someone had asked. He, um, one of uh, uh, in, in advance, they'd uh, pointed out that uh, in Lothian, the um, they've been vaccinating food bank workers before the um, before the over 80s because there's no guidance as to who actually are the sort of vital health, health and social, social care workers. I mean, do you think, you know, not to, not to sort of politicise this, but do you think the the rollout has been handled as well in Scotland as it as it has elsewhere in the, in the UK? Well, there's been major issues with the rollout in Scotland, and, and that's why I say it's not just coming from politicians trying to make political points. I think that would be wrong. These are concerns that are being raised with GPs right now. They're saying the bureaucracy and getting the vaccine to them is preventing them from uh, vaccinating as many people as possible. You know, they are at the cold base right now. They are seeing there's opportunities for them to ramp up their efforts and they can't do that. Now, the Scottish Government like to try and say, well, it's issues with supply, but it's very clear they've got over 700,000 doses allocated to them. And as soon as they're manufactured and allocated to the Scottish Government, it becomes their responsibility. The Scottish Government's vaccine plan makes it very clear that they issue the contract to the companies that then take it from England up to Scotland and then disperse it around Scotland. So there's an awful lot of issues that we have to continue to challenge the Scottish Government on over the vaccine, because this is the hope out of COVID-19. The hope that we're all looking towards is this vaccine and uh, you know, a comprehensive rollout of the vaccine. And there's serious concerns at the way that's been done in Scotland at the moment. And of course, of course, one of the more depressing uh, aspects of this has been seeing uh, some of the SMPs, well, so certainly some of their online supporters, sort of be, being resentful that they are dependent on an English vaccine, and that the you know, and and even even sort of conspiracy theories that the vaccines of like Scotland isn't getting its fair share of vaccines because the English want to punish the Scots, it, which sort of shows how everything now becomes a a debate about the uh, about the union, and everything becomes part of the sort of grievance uh, culture. Yeah, and it's not an English vaccine. This is a, a UK vaccine. The United Kingdom. Uh, you know, the strength of the United Kingdom ensured that we had these vaccines ready for approval before other countries to ensure that we could uh, pre-order you know, huge amounts of these vaccines to allow the rollout to be happening right now. You look at the United Kingdom compared to the European Union and how fast we are getting on with this vaccine rollout across the country. The figures from the weekend were exceptional to see those many, that many vaccines delivered 
over the weekend and we can continue to ramp up our efforts across the UK, but I don't want Scotland to fall further behind and there are real issues. You know, you mentioned Lothian earlier. Lothian uh, has one of the smallest uh, vaccination rates in mainland Scotland, yet uh, Tayside, you know, not that far away from Lothian, it has more than double the percentage of people vaccinated um, for COVID-19. So we're already seeing not just a difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but within Scotland, big differences in terms of the rollout. And the Scottish Government are ultimately responsible for that, have to be held accountable uh, for that, and we need to challenge them to do far better than they are. Um, you mentioned the support given by the UK government. Um, I mean, well, I, there, was, there was an interesting spat, which again, uh, people um, in, in England may not have seen, between um, uh, Kate Forbes of the SNP and Steve Barclay, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, where he, he just said, look, you know, this is all, you know, it's really interesting you can write a 900 word op-ed about how you're supporting the Scottish economy through this and not mention that we've given you all of the cash. Yeah, and I mean, it's typical of the SNP to create grievance over these issues. People in Scotland certainly understand the furlough scheme has been a UK-wide scheme that Rishi Sunak and his Treasury officials developed to protect jobs in Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And that's been a benefit of, of the United Kingdom working together for that. But we also know £8.6 billion pounds has come from the UK government to the Scottish government to help them fight this pandemic. And it just seems churlish and, you know, no reason to then avoid even mentioning the UK government when the finance secretary in Scotland was writing a 900 uh, word article uh, about the support. You know, people understand that the UK has come together to support all parts of the country. And what I'd really have prepared Kate Forbes to focus on was the fact that despite all this money coming to Scotland, we know there's hundreds of millions of pounds of that sitting, waiting with the Scottish government rather than getting out to businesses. You know, we know they have issued a fraction of the support that they've got to the businesses who need it right now. They've been very good at launching new schemes and saying there's this support will be available. And then it takes weeks for that support to then form into a, a document that councils can do to issue it to the businesses who need it. So I'd rather they focus far more on delivering this support than publicising press releases about it, which takes months to actually get to the businesses that need it to protect the jobs that are so vital here in Scotland. And I mean, which brings us on to, to the union, which is the, the sort of main topic um, today. I mean, what's, what's your elevator pitch? If you're, if you're talking to someone in Scotland who says, why, why should I care about this? What's your, what's your sort of 30 second, one minute thing? That, you know, why, why, why do you care about the union? Well, because I'm proud to be a Scot and a Brit, the union gives so much to Scotland and Scotland gives so much to the union. We've seen through this pandemic how the union can protect jobs, how the union can ensure we get vaccines into people's arms as quickly as possible. And we are better together as a sum of four nations than one individual country could achieve on its own. And I mean... There's been a, I mean, this issue is obviously becoming now, you know, dominant in politics. And, you know, quite a lot of us actually see, you know, so, as soon as the Brexit vote happened, this was kind of, this, this felt like the, the next domino to fall. Um, Gordon Brown, for example, is, is up and about today. Um, and, and, and more recently, I'm calling for a constitutional convention, which apparently, um, you know, to uh, sort of an, an, another sort of redrawing of the devolution settlement. Is, is that something that you're, um, that you're interested in and that, you, that you'd like to see? Well, what I'm really interested in, and you know, I, I've followed what Gordon Brown and others have said on this, but what I'm really interested in is the fight we've got here in Scotland in the next few months. We have an opportunity uh, to challenge the SNP on their record in government, because after 14 years, there are many areas uh, they have let down uh, in Scotland in terms of both policy and parts of Scotland, uh, which have been forgotten about by the centralising Scottish government. But we also have to challenge them on their plans for another divisive independence referendum. You know, I, I was quite clear yesterday, they should be fighting to protect, protect jobs, they should be fighting to help the businesses who are struggling to survive, rather than fighting for another divisive independence referendum, indeed threatening to even go to court for that. So I think, you know, while I listen to what Gordon Brown and others are saying, the focus has to be on taking that challenge to the SNP right now. 
And um, where, I mean, speaking of Gordon Brown, um, where does the role of the Labour Party come in? Obviously, they're, they're currently searching for a new leader. You know, they've they've not been as uh, as full throated in their support of the union as as the as the Scottish Conservatives have have recently. And some of their MPs, you know, partly as a result of twenty sixteen, some of their MPs have said, you know, that they they won't sort of um, sort of join a patriotic front with. You. That's sorry, that's the horrible phrase. Um, but they you know they they they're, they're nervous about about joining in with you. I mean, what's what's the role for Labour in this? Um, um, in, in this battle? Well, we've seen the role of Labour, you know, diminish over successive elections in Scotland. At every election to the Scottish Parliament, the, the number of votes for the Scottish Labour Party and the number of MSPs they've returned has dropped. You know, I, I grew up uh, when the Scottish Labour Party, you know, dominated the, the whole of the country almost. It would have been easier to weigh the votes um, for Scottish Labour MPs than to actually count them. And then look at where they've arrived at now. They're the third party uh, in Scottish politics. And in terms of standing up for the union, they've made it very clear that they would prefer to work with the SNP rather than with the Conservatives. We know uh, in local councils across Scotland, they're in administration working with the SNP in several councils. But the one where Labour councillors joined with the Conservatives uh, in nearby Aberdeen City, from where I'm sitting here uh, in Murray right now, they expelled those Labour councillors for daring to work with the Scottish Conservatives to keep the SNP out. So you know, they have a, a real reluctance to work with anyone uh, to stop the SNP. And I, I put down a pledge to the two leadership uh, challengers for the Scottish Labour Party to say, work with me, you know, commit now that you will work with the Scottish Conservatives to stop the SNP. After 14 years in power, we can do so much better for Scotland. And it took them less than half an hour, less than 30 minutes, to rule that out, but they're happy to work with the SNP. And I think that says everything people need to know about Scottish Labour's position on the union. Um, one of the phrases in the, in the papers over the over the weekend was was that the um, that we need to tackle the, the woke left perception that the union is a residue of empire. I mean, do you think that is a, a genuine perception? And if so, how do you how do you tackle that? No, I, I think, you know, the union is important to each and every one of us. You know, we've got to see both the benefits of the union and, and what we give to the union. Because if anyone's watching this in, in England or Wales or, or Northern Ireland and thinks that if Scotland were to separate, the United Kingdom would just continue as normal with the other three nations, it wouldn't. It would mean so much to the, the fabric and the future of the United Kingdom as a whole. So I think it's hugely important for people in Scotland, but also right across the United Kingdom. And which actually was the next question I was going to ask. I mean, so what can those what can those of us who are in England, who are in Wales, who are in Northern Ireland, who may have family, friends, you know, the ties, connections with, with Scotland, but what, what can we realistically do? Is this is this just something that the, the Scots need to work out for themselves? Or, you know, or will they, you know, will, will, will interventions from, from the English do more and uh, in particular, um, you know, English conservatives do more more harm than good. Or, or what are the what are you, what are the useful productive things that people can can do to to support this fight? Well, I think the most useful thing is is to end the, the defeatism. That's what I mentioned in my um, Scottish um, conference element of the UK uh, party conference back in the autumn. That defeatism and disinterest in the union um, was one of the worst things for our support here in Scotland. People who already believe that the union has somehow um, you know, lost this argument in Scotland are wrong. You know, I don't believe uh, that independence is inevitable. I think we've got a very strong, passionate, positive case to deliver for Scotland's place in the union. And we just need to ensure that all unionists believe in that, all unionists get behind that. And uh, that's a, a more positive message that we can take to people in Scotland rather than them reading that, well, people in England or Wales or Northern Ireland already think it, Scotland has left. It's not. Scotland's got a lot to offer. The UK has got a lot to offer Scotland as well. Uh, and just in this constant talk, well, it's inevitable. The SNP will win a majority. No, it's not. We've shown in the past that's not inevitable because of the way the, S the SNP lost their majority as a result of the Scottish Conservatives. And independence is not inevitable either. And we've just got to change that narrative. So um, in, a, in a profile of you today, which I, I recommend on Politico, which I recommend um, people uh, reading, uh, you're, you're described as Boris Johnson's other Scottish headache, uh, noting your sort of uh, history of, uh, of speaking up for yourself and the, the many times you've disagreed with, uh, with, with the government in particular over, over Dominic Cummings' uh, trip to Barnard Castle. Um, but 
is is Boris your English headache? I mean, the, the polls are pretty clear that he is not a popular figure in, in Scotland. How, how do you get around get around that? Well, I think the, the future of Scotland is, is far more than individual personal uh, politics and personality politics. It's, you know, Boris Johnson is the, the Prime Minister now, Nicola Sturgeon is the First Minister now. They do not continue indefinitely, but Scotland's place in the United Kingdom is so crucial and so important that we can't uh, bring that down to an issue about who leads the United Kingdom at the moment or who leads the SNP or who leads uh, the Scottish Government. In terms of, you know, my... Uh, background and, and what that profile was looking at. Yeah, it said I, I, I've been controversial in the past. I've, you know, uh, taken positions that those in, in leadership may not agree with, both at a national level and at a local level. And that's because I'm, I'm willing to fight. I want to fight for what's best for, for Scotland or when I was a councillor, what was best for my ward in Falkenberg's Lamb Bride. And I don't think that's a bad thing in politics, that people are willing to stand up for their beliefs, fight for what they think is right for the people they represent and challenge those in power if they're doing something wrong. That's why Scottish Conservatives are the ones challenging at the SNP right now in Scotland on a range of issues. And that's why if I think the UK government have got something wrong or could do something better for Scotland, I'll challenge them as well. But ultimately, I'd like to see the two governments working together far more. You know, in Scotland, people expect the UK government and the Scottish government to work together to deliver for them, not to constantly be fighting, particularly wrangling over this constitutional issue, which, you know, going back to the Kate Forbes article with uh, Steve Barclay, it seems you know, the Scottish government can't even acknowledge right now, uh, you know, a lot of the support they're getting from the UK government. So let's put that to side, put the divisive politics away, and let's just focus on what matters to people here in Scotland right now. I mean, speaking of people doing doing something wrong, obviously the the battle between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Nicholas, uh, yeah, between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Hammond has been um, e extraordinary. And um, this falling out, the the, the war of words, and the the um, the, <coughs> the investigations. I mean, what what's your threshold for at, at what point that becomes uh, an issue where she, you know, where 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 she can't uh, continue if she's if she's found to have lied. To the um, to this to to, to to her fellow MSPs is that is that the threshold do you you think where you, you she can't do you, you can't have confidence in her as a leader anymore? Well, I think you've got to look at where we are already, and I think many commentators have started to say if this was a, a UK Prime Minister being criticised and accused of lying by a former UK Prime Minister, things would be far more serious uh, than they seem to be uh, portrayed in Scotland at the moment. But this is absolutely crucial. This comes down to a matter of trust of the First Minister uh, and the evidence is building that she has lied to MSPs, that she has misled the Scottish Parliament and that for me is clearly a, a resigning matter. We've seen resignations of uh, previous First Ministers and party leaders here in Scotland for much less and indeed opinion polls have shown in the last week that 68% of people believe if Nicola Sturgeon is found to have lied to the Scottish Parliament, she would then have to resign as First Minister. They don't think it's acceptable, 68% of people don't think it would be acceptable for someone found lying to continue as First Minister. We've got an absolute deluge of questions, so I'll, I'll switch to those um, uh, after this. One last question, which is, um, looking in a sort of broad, broader sweep, I mean, look, looking back on it, what should have been done differently since 1997 or, or, or even since 2014 or, or 2016 to, to, to put the union in a stronger position? I mean, what, what, what were the key, the key mistakes that were, that were made in, in, in your view? Well, none of this is new. I've said it all before. But if you look back to 1997 and the referendum and then the establishment of the Scottish Parliament in 1999, I think both Labour and Conservative governments have been guilty of devolving and forgetting for putting large sums of money into the, the Scottish Government and then not really looking at how that's been spent. I'm getting an awful lot of concerns now from people, you know, really looking for more evidence as to how the Scottish Government has spent this huge increase in funding they've received from the UK Government during the pandemic. And people want to know that their money has been well spent, whether it's protecting jobs, whether it's going into the NHS to fight COVID-19. And I think that the UK Government needs to look a lot more at how departments engage with the the Scottish Government and how when funding goes to the Scottish Government we make sure that is spent in the best interests of people across Scotland. But in terms of since 2014, you know, we, you know, I was on the, the, the unionist side of that argument, I voted to 
remain part of the United Kingdom. I campaigned strongly for that. And I was of the belief, as most of us were, that whichever side won, both sides would respect the result. We were told that whether it was uh, to leave uh, the United Kingdom or remain part of the United Kingdom, both sides would respect that. And they clearly didn't. The, the movement to separate Scotland from the rest of the UK took a, a, a deep breath on the September day in 2014 and then immediately just started off campaigning again. Whereas some of us uh, in the unionist campaign uh, maybe just assumed, well, that fight had been won and thought we could move on to other issues that were affecting people in Scotland. So it just shows that we cannot give up in terms of presenting the positive case of the Union, the positive case for the United Kingdom. Um, in much the same way, the SNP and Nationalists never gave up their fight to separate Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom. And actually, sorry, what, what, one last question, because it's, it's just seeing that lovely picture um, uh, on beside you has, has just reminded me. Um, we were talking uh, before this about our, our children and, and, and lockdown and um, and, and, and how is this impacting? I mean, do you? I mean, do you, do you think that um, uh, reopening schools should be the, the, the first priority for the uh, for the, for the Scottish government um, as as the as the vaccine starts to take effect? I mean, do you do you do you want them to to sort of move faster towards um, opening up, or, or would you prefer to see a more a more cautious approach? We said uh, in Scotland, you know, the priority has to be uh, young people and their education. Those in education coming to an end of their education last year uh, had the disruption over exams and then the absolute chaos from the Scottish Government over the actual exam process and their results. But the, this year's young people in schools this year have had uh, almost a, a full academic year uh, disrupted as a result of this. And we want to see schools reopen as quickly as it is safely possible to do. But we also have to focus on why were the Scottish Government so inept at preparing for a potential future lockdown. They didn't listen to the concerns that were raised during the first lockdown about the patchy approach to online learning across the country, about how this is really affecting those from a more disadvantaged background and advantaged backgrounds uh, disproportionately during this uh, current crisis. And there was an awful lot of time, uh, energy and resources wasted in the months between the first lockdown and the second one that could really have been invested on improving uh, the online uh, learning tools for pupils across Scotland. And I think the SNP still have to answer for that. Fair enough. Now, um, let's go to the, to the questions, um, of which there are quite a lot and quite a lot of very good ones. Um, let's start with um, George Frifgarn asks, um, if the SNP try to hold an illegal referendum, should unionists run a campaign not to vote in it? I would absolutely boycott that. It's, you know, I go back to the point I've made a couple of times um, this morning. We were told the 2014 referendum was a gold standard of referendums. Nicola Sturgeon accepted that. If that is the gold standard, then no one who, not just who believes in the union, but who believes in democracy, should enter into this um, wildcat referendums uh, that would have no actual uh, you know, bearing in terms of the, the outcome would not be enforceable. And again, it's moving all the focus away on what Scottish politicians should be concentrating on right now, protecting jobs, you know, improving the economy, it's supporting communities right across the country, making sure our education system is fit for our young people. That's where the focus should be, not on wildcat referendums, which I would absolutely boycott because they would be an absolute waste of precious time and resources when our focus should be on defeating COVID-19, rolling out the vaccine eh, and concentrating on our economic recovery. Um, on the topic of education, um, Vernon Bognonor says, um, after 14 years of SNP government, the particular weaknesses in education are FE, numeracy and, and literacy. Um, weaknesses in skills in Scotland are a matter for the whole UK, not just Scotland. Can the UK government be persuaded to offer specific grants to Scotland to improve these, these issues? The, the, the SNP could hardly refuse this and it would show the value of the union. Well, we've seen the SNP have actually refused in the past offers of uh, help and support for our college and university sectors, but the education uh, system in Scotland right now is one uh, that has lost its international reputation as one that was, you know, lauded uh, for its greatness. We have tumbled down the international rankings, and that's why I put schools and, and rebuilding our education system at the heart of a, a policy document I issued last year. It's about recruiting 3,000 additional teachers. That's one of our asks as Scottish Conservatives in the budget uh, here in Scotland for uh, 
that's planned for Thursday is to recruit these 3,000 additional teachers in Scotland. It's about investing in our schools because far too many schools are uh, deemed in terms of their condition as poor or bad. We want to ensure that at the end of the next parliament, no pupil goes to a school that's in a condition rating as poor or bad. We want to introduce a national tutoring scheme to make sure it's not just those who can afford extra tuition, it's those who have the, the ability who can uh, move forward with uh, additional tuition that can get it right across the country. So we have got a, a significant policy platform to rebuild our educational standards here in Scotland. But you know, to go back to the, the question about um, accepting support from the UK government, that's what I want. I want the two governments to work together. But all too often we see the SNP refusing support for political reasons, rather than actually working with the UK government to improve things in Scotland. Well, I think this is the, the definition of, of an easy question from a, a prominent Scottish Conservative, uh, Tom Strathclyde. How can we all help you do well in May? <laughs> well, there, there, there's lots to do in the run up to May. You know, we need support, uh, financial uh, support to get that message across. We need to uh, all be united in our message that it's not a foregone conclusion. We don't have to accept that the SNP it will win a majority at the election. We don't have to accept that that will lead to another independence referendum to separate Scotland out um, of the United Kingdom. And we all have to get behind our plans and our policies to rebuild Scotland, to focus on COVID-19, to focus on the recovery from COVID-19, not another divisive referendum. So um, there's been a couple of questions and, and please do, do keep the questions coming. Um, uh, but there's well, actually a few questions which are about um, the ec economics and in particular the, um, the sort of trans the, the transfers that Scotland receives. Um, one of the most interesting and sort of alarming things I've seen recently was a um, focus group done by the These Islands um, think tank where talking to sort of, uh, you know, the, the sort of under the key swing voters who in a sort of quite a similar way almost to, to, to Brexit voters in 2016 did, did not actually believe that the rest of the UK subsidises Scotland. Um, you know, they, they just said, like, you know, those figures must be must be wrong. I mean, how do you how do you how, how do you sort of persuade people of the reality of the situation without sort of making without sort of sounding like you're, you're just haranguing, lecturing them? Well, I think it goes a bit back to what I was saying earlier about devolving and forgetting. You know, the fact that, that a lot of people in Scotland now don't recognise the UK government's investment in Scotland is, is because UK government departments have allowed that. We've allowed this huge transfer of uh, finance from the UK to Scottish government and not get the, the credit for that, that you know, the Scottish economy is backed up by billions of pounds uh, from the UK government. So we do need to do more to remind people that actually the, the grants that have gone to businesses during this pandemic have been made available because of the UK government increasing the funding uh, to the Scottish government. The you know, internal market bill, uh, which was published uh, last year, is a way of the UK government directly investing uh, in Scotland. I think that's another good thing to remind people that the two governments can uh, both uh, support individuals and communities in Scotland. Now, that's been criticised by the SNP as, as bypassing the Scottish Government. That's, that's rubbish. You know, it's quite right for the Scottish Government to invest in Scotland in the same way the UK Government can invest in Scotland. And I think people would really question why the SNP wouldn't accept uh, that funding if it just means we're getting more money into Scotland. So it's a bit, uh, you know, there's a two-pronged approach here. Remind people about the investment in Scotland that's delivering the services they're getting right now and direct investment by the UK Government as well. You've addressed this slightly previously, but um, Tess White asks, would you support a deferral of the May election for six months so that the vaccine programme can take effect? It's um, obviously it's a decision uh, up to six months for the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament. There was a bill passed in December last year which gives the presiding officer that uh, power. He currently has the power to delay it for a month. That would allow him to delay it for up to six months. At the moment, our focus is, as a political party, on fighting the elections in May. That's why we're getting candidates uh, finalised across the country. That's why our policies continue to be developed. But we also have to look at the, the public health um, situation at the time and it may be possible to hold uh, an election in May but what would the campaigning in the run-up to May be like. So we've got to continue to listen to the public health advice on that but right now we as a party are so focused on that May date uh, as when the election will be. Um, again, a few questions on, on, on a similar theme. Of, I mean, should the pro-union parties cooperate more? You've already said that Labour has re rejected bids to um, 
uh, to co collaborate. I mean, could you even see a system whereby, you know, you and Labour have a sort of an informal pact system where, or you and some of the other pro-union parties basically, you know, agree not to stand e against each other to avoid splitting the vote in certain, in certain uh, seats? Well, well, that's my problem. And it's, I've already extended that uh, offer to work with the Scottish Labour Party to, to defeat the SNP, to get them out of government after 14 years of failure in Scotland. And Scottish Labour immediately refused that. And, and you've also got to look at what they're doing at a UK level. Keir Starmer is, is speaking about what he would do for, for devolution. Really the same message that we heard from Ed Miliband when he was leader, from Jeremy Corbyn when he was leader. And Keir Starmer can, can speak a lot about devolution, but ultimately he knows his route back into uh, or, or into number 10 would be through Scotland. At the moment, the Labour Party with one MP and third in the Scottish Parliament will not be you know, building up the number of seats in uh, from Scottish constituencies to Westminster anytime soon, which means they will have to work with the SNP. They could only get a majority uh, to get Keir Starmer as Prime Minister into number 10 with the support of the SNP. So they are going to do nothing uh, to support uh, the union if they're working with the nationalists. And that's the problem uh, that they uh, face uh, in Scotland, that people see them more willing to work with the na nationalists rather than accept my offer to work with unionists to, to take the fight to the SNP. Um, question from an, an, an anonymous SND: How should how should a topic of Brexit be handled in terms of promotion of the union? Is it something basically um, it should it should be minimised, uh, or do you highlight the opportunities, or do you use the uh, you know the the the, the 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 sort of the saga of 2016 to 2020 to to try and remind people that breaking up isn't always as easy as it seems? Well, there's a lot of different things in there which could all uh, come together. Um, in, in different ways to uh, tackle Brexit. One, we've got to uh, remember uh, that you know, a majority, 62% of people in Scotland voted to remain part of the European Union, but also remember over a million Scots voted to leave. We've got to remember that throughout the period from 2016 until at the end of last year, the SNP took every single opportunity, Nicola Sturgeon, all her ministers, all our activists, to say how bad a no-deal Brexit would be. And then when they get a deal, they still don't support it and therefore support no deal. So we've got to highlight the hypocrisy from the uh, SNP on this issue. And we've also got to look at the opportunities that there are. For example, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Internal Market Bill is an opportunity for the UK government to directly invest in Scotland, which was not possible uh, when we were uh, in the, the European Union because the EU could directly invest into Scotland, but the UK government could not. So there's a lot of powers, there's a lot of um, extra funding uh, coming to Scotland as a result of leaving the European Union and we've got to ensure they are used to the best ability to improve um, the lives of individuals and communities and businesses here in Scotland. Um, Rhiannon Bartlett asks whether you're concerned uh, that the problems Scottish fisheries are facing since the start of the year will affect um, support for the Conservatives. I suppose there's two questions there. How concerned are you about the problems fisheries are facing and will they affect support for the Conservatives? Well, I'm, I'm really concerned and, and, you know, I put less concern on, on our electoral chances than I do on the genuine legitimate concerns of fishermen right now. That's where my priority is. That's why I, you know, made it very clear in the House of Commons uh, a few weeks ago that we needed a compensation scheme. I'm glad that was introduced. £23 million pounds is, is important, but we've got to get that funding out to fishermen as quickly as possible. Uh, and I've been quite upfront and honest that I hear their concerns. You know, I share their frustrations at some of the problems they're facing at the moment. But these are problems that our two governments have to resolve. The Scottish Government were given £200 million pounds by the UK Government to prepare for Brexit and haven't spent all that money. And now we've got problems at the hub that they oversee at Lark Hall, and that's one of the issues where we have a bottleneck. But there are also issues with the added bureaucracy, uh, the forms people have to fill in, and that is uh, posing problems that the UK Government are responsible for. So I've made it clear that I'm hearing all these concerns from, from fishermen and I'm determined to do something about it. That's why I was determined to stand up for the compensation scheme. That's why I'm determined to stand up uh, for their calls for uh, a more streamlined process to improve what they're experiencing both in Scotland as a result of the Scottish Government's uh, handling at Mark Hall and the UK Government's uh, handling of the system uh, at a UK level as well. Um, 
Oh, sorry, there was a question which which just oh yeah, there we go. Um, question from uh, Don Peebles: What is the single action Douglas Ross would implement brackets instantly, which would improve uh, Scotland's finances? Uh, well, I would ensure it. I mean, this wouldn't just be a single action, but a ten day turnaround from when a business um, uh, uh, applies for support to getting it in the bank account. Far too often we're seeing businesses waiting weeks and months for support. We know there's hundreds of millions of pounds available uh, to the Scottish Government that's not getting out to businesses. So if I had to be asked for one thing right now, it would be turning around that support as quickly as possible to ensure that businesses knew that as soon as they apply for something, they've got 10 days to wait uh, as an absolute maximum for that money to get into their accounts, rather than as we're seeing from the Scottish Government at the moment, weeks and months passing before any of that money gets out to the businesses who need it. Okay, um, a question, I, I think I know your answer to this one. Um, who will you be supporting when Scotland play England uh, in, at Wembley in June? Yeah, absolutely Scotland, and I'm delighted that since 1998 I've not been able to support the men's national team uh, at a major finals. Uh, I was still at school in Forest Academy during France 98 when the Scottish team uh, qualified and played in the final uh, finals tournament and it's great that they're going to be back in uh, at you know, 2021 and uh, you know facing the old enemy at Wembley. But I suppose a follow-up question for me, um, we, but would you then support England against against other teams? Uh, well, I always then move on to supporting the refereeing team, so I want to see who's <laughs> appointed to, to all the games, and I'll support my refereeing colleagues uh, throughout Europe, who I know will do an outstanding job officiating the tournament. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if we had time, I'd get into your views on VAR. <laughs> <laughs> No, that, that that that's a that's probably the most elegant uh, elegant dodging of that question I, I think I've ever I've ever come across. Um, qu question from Martin Lejeune: What is the point of the union for England? Um, you know, in in his view, which obviously you wouldn't share, you know, costs money, endless demand for either more powers or referendums. Why why should we bother? He says because the United Kingdom doesn't just somehow continue as is if you take out Scotland. You know, the the fabric of the the union flag absolutely differs if you take the saltire out of it. You know, we spoke earlier about friends and families uh, living at either side of the border. Scotland has, you, you know, so many people have moved to England to, to work or to live uh, and vice versa. You know, this is an issue that affects the whole of the United Kingdom. And if people think it's just a Scottish issue or, you know, how does it affect England? It affects us all. It affects our United Kingdom. And um, question from Kester McKellen. Um, Mr. Ross, what are your thoughts on and uh, on advocating two referendums? The first, you know, um, you know, which some people were talking about before Brexit, basically a confirmatory referendum once a deal is known. Um, you could also add the, the third option of um, yes, no or, or Devo Max, which is another way, way people have been uh, putting it. Well, well, first of all, I'm against any more referendums. I think we've had enough uncertainty uh, and division in Scotland um, for an awful long time. But on this proposal to have a first referendum and then a discussion about what that would actually mean, a, a confirmationary referendum, you know, my concern is then you, you almost legitimise that, that independence is going to happen. And I don't believe uh, it is an inevitable, and I've made that point very clear. And then if that were to be the case, you just get into this constant uh, opportunities for the SNP to yet again take uh, exception to what the UK government would be doing or, or what the other side would be proposing. And I see that being to their benefit, they would you know, uh, create division where there was none. They would look at opportunities to further divide the country when actually I think the best thing to do would be focus on where we are right now as a United Kingdom working together, not creating more division. Um, another similar question. Um, says, um, Douglas, uh, the economic argument will always be important for the union, but as the Sunday Times survey at the weekend showed, among young Scots in particular, there's no sense of British identity. Um, how does the UK government or, or the union side more broadly uh, try to change that so that, so that you know, Westminster, London, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, don't, don't seem like foreign countries. Yeah, I mean, it, we've got a big challenge uh, on our hands with that, particularly with the, the beliefs of, of many young people at the moment, but it's not a challenge that we can't face up. There's a lot we can promote about what the, the UK gives to, to young people uh, and to everyone, the opportunities it provides. The you know, If we look at the, the Turing scheme, for example, now there's been a lot of criticism from 
uh, the SNP about us leaving Erasmus, but look at the opportunities for uh, young people right across the United Kingdom with the tutoring scheme. And we need to promote these opportunities. We need to remind people these are opportunities that are available right across the UK and to people in Scotland, Wales, England and Northern Ireland. And again, get back to that positive message. I understand there's a really credible argument about the economics of independence and how our country would suffer if we were to separate from the rest of the United Kingdom. But we've also got to give a more positive vision for, for Scotland, not just on the economics, but on a wide variety of issues. Um, again, tying together a couple of, uh, of questions. And sorry, I'm just leaping from thing to thing as, as, uh, as, I, as I scroll through the, the many questions. Um, uh, so, so someone said a couple of questions. I mean, how do we, what, what more can we do to support the private sector, which um, is obviously what will drive any recovery, which, which will drive the economy, and which, according to the questioner, the SNP doesn't really care that much about. And also, how do you persuade um, businesses and the private sector to, to be more vocal about, um, about the union, um, given that privately many of them um, will say they think it will be, you know, they, they, many of them are far more supportive of it in private than they are able to be in public. Well, first of all, it's absolutely crucial that we involve business and, and the private sector far more in the decision making in Scotland at the moment. Months ago, I suggested uh, launching a coronavirus business advisory council, which would see businesses come on board and working with the Scottish government over the re restrictions that were potentially going to be introduced or as restrictions were relaxed. Nicola Sturgeon was posed that suggestion in Holyrood and said she would consider it and nothing's happened. Business is an afterthought of this SNP government, and while they were able to set up a task force for independence, they're not able to engage with a business task force to help them uh, protect these businesses and the jobs that they provide. So it's absolutely crucial that we get businesses uh, involved, and this is something I've been saying for some time. In terms of, the again, the budget coming up uh, later on this week, Scottish Conservatives are, are proposing an extension to the rates relief uh, in Scotland and a freeze of the poundage, and we're also uh, proposing there's no more tax hikes in Scotland because this SNP have made Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. We want to ensure that as we get through this uh, pandemic, people have more money in their pockets to go out and support uh, the businesses here in Scotland and across the UK. Uh, and that's a way uh, of supporting businesses by ensuring the SNP don't uh, increase tax even further than they already have. In terms of getting business to be more vocal, I agree with that and I'm beginning to see signs uh, that businesses are going to be more vocal, they are going to, to stand up to the SNP. I'm sorry, it's getting very bright here in Murray, I might have to pull the blind oh, down. Yeah, it's like you got in a, in a moment. In fact, if I can just hold on one second or I'm going to be blinded for the rest of this. I'm not in some Mediterranean country. It's just beautiful. Don't, don't, don't worry. It's it, it's gorgeous here as well. But I've got the I've got the yeah. curtains drawn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was just saying, you know, I am hearing more businesses now, uh, you know, being willing to to stand up. We had businesses and uh, you know who have supported UK government uh, legislation to uh, protect how we uh, trade throughout the United Kingdom when the SNP. Uh, opposed it. They were more vocal in that legislation than they had been previously. So I am beginning to start seeing some businesses being more willing to, to show what the union means to, to them as a business, to their employees, uh, and what it would mean uh, for trade across the UK if we were to separate, because it would have a, a crucial and detrimental impact on our businesses here in Scotland. A okay, um, question from Alexander Hutchinson. Uh, given Glasgow will be hosting the COP26 climate conference, um, what more do you believe needs to be done to make it a global success story? I think they're talking about COP26 rather than Glasgow, but if you have any thoughts on uh, making Glasgow a global success story, I'm sure we'd be happy to hear them as well. Well, well Glasgow is already a, a global success so story when we see uh, everything that that major city uh, does and has done in the past. But COP26 is a great opportunity. It's the biggest conference the UK will ever have held. It's in Scotland, which shows again the, the United Kingdom attracting uh, this type of investment and that benefiting Scotland. And there's a lot of work that has been done and continues to be done to prepare uh, Glasgow and, and the whole of the UK for COP26. But I also want to ensure that we have meaningful outcomes from COP26. You know, the, the environment and, and the future of our country is a crucial issue, particularly for some of those younger voters you were mentioning 
earlier. And if we can show that we're not just hosting a conference, but we're leading the narrative, we're leading the debate, we're driving it, the changes forward, I think that's a, another positive message we can take, particularly to young voters. And, and finally, in COP26, I don't just want it to be 11 days in November and then we forget about it and, and what Scotland provided us as a conference venue. We've got to take the outcomes from COP26 and ensure that they have a, a meaningful and positive impact uh, both here in the UK and around the world in the months and years ahead. And that will then mean that COP26, Glasgow COP26, has been a success. Um, question from Alex Moulton. Uh, vaccine rollout is obviously key, which you, you've mentioned, but if a new mutation arrives, we, 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 which is resistant to the vaccine, we're kind of back at square one, although you know, we're not, not quite because we have much more vaccine capacity. Um, do you support the uh, push for tougher border controls? Um, yeah, I, I was asked about this last week, and I, I want to ensure that the current border controls that we have uh, have the desired impact. So, you know, we still got to wait to see what the uh, overall impact has been of the changes to the border controls uh, announced recently. But obviously, the government at a UK level continue to look at this, and there's proposals for for tougher uh, quarantine measures uh, being discussed uh, throughout government at the moment. So, again, I think it's looking at all the science, all the evidence what it would suggest that ensuring when we do implement some changes, we see if they are effective or not before we look at further changes. A yeah, um, couple of questions again about the referendum, which keep, keeps coming up. Um, Richard Percival from the Daily Express asks, um, if the SNP continue to push a second independence referendum, would you consider a mo motion of no confidence in the first minister, especially if a second vote is a central focus of um, the uh, kind of recovery plan from COVID? Um, uh, Rachel Wearmouth asks, um, is the only referendum you consider legal uh, via a Section 30 order? Um, I mean, we, we, we've had a few others. Um, uh, and you know, do you think that Westminster will completely reject the SNP's referendum request? Um, yeah, lots of. Um... Uh, so, if, if I remember all those questions, first of all, on, Sorry, on Rachel, no, 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 you're you're quite right. Uh, on on Rachel's point, yes, I think a Section Thirty order is the uh, correct mechanism for any future referendum if we were to hold one, because as I say, that's how the two governments agreed to the twenty fourteen referendum. They agreed that was the gold standard because it went through a Section 30 order. There was the uh, discussion between the Scottish and UK governments and an agreed uh, position in terms of the franchise, the date, the question uh, was arrived at. And that is the way you conduct uh, business in a democracy. You use uh, the, the procedures that are clearly laid down. In terms of, uh, I think it was Richard's point uh, about the SNP making this uh, the focus of their campaign, I, I think that's... Sadly, the, the reality of, of where we are right now, that the SNP will um, you know, promote independence and another divisive referendum over absolutely everything else. John Swinney, uh, the Deputy First Minister, was saying that Scotland somehow needed uh, independence as a way out of COVID-19, which is ridiculous. You know, all the effort, all the uh, energy and time and focus should be on beating COVID-19, should be on protecting as many people as possible with the testing system, uh, with looking at the restrictions, whether they're at the right level or not, and getting people vaccinated. But when you get the Deputy First Minister of the SNP government saying they need independence as a way out of COVID-19, that shows what you're up against, that mentality that puts independence and separation above all else. Yes, in independence is the answer, and it doesn't really matter what the question is. Exactly. Um, um, so just, just to follow up on that, um, so Matthew Holhouse from The Economist asks, um, how confident is Douglas that Boris Johnson will say no to a second independence referendum if the SNP do well in May? Doesn't it all ultimately come down to the PM's judgment on whether to roll the dice on a, on a Section 30? Well, the Prime Minister has made it clear, you know, he is a unionist, he's a member of the Conservative and Unionist Party, and the Conservative and Unionists uh, at the UK level, and particularly at a Scottish level, do not want another divisive independence referendum. We are absolutely clear, we're the clearest party uh, in Scotland, uh, our um, opposition to another independence referendum, and indeed we're the only party that has the strength across Scotland to challenge the SNP. We've seen Labour have failed to do that, uh, and we are the party that will challenge the SNP and do not want to uh, have Scotland taken back into that division that we faced between 2007 and the ultimate referendum in 2014. 
Um, speaking of the Prime Minister, uh, one of his uh, the things he's he's mentioned before is the idea of a, a bridge between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, Michaela Wright asks, where, or a, a tunnel or bridge, you know, some kind of um, connection. Um, Michaela Wright asks uh, where, whether you'd uh, support that. Well, you're, you're right, it could be a tunnel, it could be a bridge. There's major issues uh, in that stretch of water uh, in terms of what was dumped there many years ago. What I absolutely support is any added investment into Scotland. And what we've seen, you know, where that uh, tunnel or bridge uh, would link Scotland to Northern Ireland is uh, an area of the country that has been sadly neglected by the SNP in terms of infrastructure investment. We need to pump a lot of money into the infrastructure uh, of the, the south and the southwest of Scotland. Uh, and that's something that can be done uh, by the UK government directly investing uh, in these areas because it has been neglected by an SNP government for so long. Um, question from uh, an anonymous SND, which is, um, how much of a threat is Reform UK, which is um, Nigel Farage's latest um, vehicle, and uh, Michelle uh, Ballantyne, who's MSP, who's, who's defected? I mean, are, are, are they something you're concentrating on, or, or is your focus firmly on, on the SNP? Well, my focus is firmly on the SNP because uh, despite all these other parties coming in to say they would challenge the SNP uh, or anything else they would do, they don't have the strength across the country. You know, we are the main opposition party in Scotland. I've mentioned before that you know our opinion polling right now is in a similar, if not better, place than where we were in 2016, where we defeated uh, the SNP, stopping them getting uh, the majority they went into that election with. So we are the only credible challengers with the strength right across the country to take on the SNP. Uh, and I think you know any support for these smaller parties simply plays into the SNP hands. It helps the SNP uh, rather than. It's strengthening our, our unionist voice uh, in the Scottish Parliament because if we can coalesce that around the Scottish Conservatives, we've shown in the past that we have the strength uh, and the power uh, to stop the SNP. And I mean, one final question, um, just uh, uh, from uh, from Carrie Tuff: If the Scottish Conservatives win a majority in May, um, what are your top three priorities? And, so the, it's uh, and, 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 and let's take the union out of this, you know, in, in terms of yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that, that issue will be settled uh, because, you know, we've been very clear uh, on our support for the union. But the top three priorities are ensuring that we uh, power up Scotland, you know, we build back better, we have the, the recovery in terms of infrastructure investment and protecting jobs. We ensure that our schools have the support they need by investing uh, in both the infrastructure and our teachers uh, and our education system and making sure we protect our NHS and the funding that's going in there to uh, get us through this pandemic and to get the vaccine into people's arms to allow us to return to former normality. So investing in our country, supporting our education system and backing our NHS. Well, um, Douglas, I mean, thank you very much. You, you're a very busy man and uh, it's uh, been very, very kind of you to take this time. I'm very sorry to all the people who asked questions and, and I couldn't get, uh, get to them, um, but we did have a, a, an absolute deluge of them. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, please uh, sign up to our mailing list in order to uh, get invitations to more such events. But um, uh, thank you very much to, to Douglas Ross and uh, very best of luck uh, in May and beyond.